Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the inaugural event in what promises to be an urgently important series of conversations. I'm Lori Lefkowitz, Director of Northeastern University's Humanity Center, the home for interdisciplinary faculty research and collaboration, often among units, and as is the case with this series across institutions Humanity centers are places where, where faculty have the flexibility to bring shared expertise to matters of compelling and immediate concern. The Northeastern Humanity Center is very pleased to co-sponsor with Harvard's Mahindra Humanity Center and the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program, this year long series on composite bodies, race, gender, and technology. Alert to multiplying forms of surveillance, our experts will take up questions of technology, embodiment, and power from an intersectional feminist lens. This series will address, from many disciplinary perspectives, how the machine measurement and tracking of bodies are reconceptualizing notions of privacy, complicating the boundaries of the body as an integrated whole, and reproducing and reinforcing biases based on race, class, gender, and other historically disabling taxonomies. I wanna thank you all for being here and thank the staff of our centers who have cooperated so effectively and add my personal appreciation to the organizers, including my friend and board member, distinguished professor Patricia Williams. It is my privilege to pass the mic to Professor Susanna Clark, Director of Harvard's Mahindra Humanity Center, who will introduce the organizers more fully. Susanna. Thank you, Lori, and greetings to all of you joining us online today. Uh, as you just heard, I'm Susanna Clark, Director of the Mahindra Humanity Center uh, here at Harvard University. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the two co-hosts of Composite Bodies, Gender, Race, and Technology, our seminar series today. Uh, first of all, Patricia Williams is University Distinguished Professor of Law and Humanities at Northeastern University. She is the author of the canonical book, Alchemy of Race and Rights, and a pioneer in the field of critical race studies. Her interdisciplinary feminist work remains at the cutting edge of legal scholarship. It is also my distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague, Caroline Light, who is senior lecturer and director of undergraduate studies in Harvard's program on studies of women, gender, and sexuality. Her most recent book is called Stand Your Ground, A History of America's Love Affair with Lethal Self-Defense. And with that, it is my great honor and pleasure to turn things over to Caroline Light. Caroline. Thank you so much, Susanna and Lori, for your warm introduction and your welcome and for being here tonight. On behalf of my seminar co-convener, Patricia Williams, I want to express our sincerest thanks for the generous support of all three of our co-sponsoring institutions, the Northeastern University Humanities Center, Harvard's Mahindra Humanity Center, and Harvard's Program in Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality. We also wish to extend a very special thanks to Mary McKinnon for her indispensable administrative support for this event, and to Gabby Fiorenza and Stephen Beal for their ongoing guidance and support throughout the series. And finally, thanks to all of you for joining us for our very first Composite Bodies Seminar. We welcome you throughout our event to submit questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, in the interest of time, we ask that you please keep your questions as brief and to the point as possible, and we will do our level best to get to as many questions as possible. And now it gives me tremendous pleasure to turn things over to Professor Patricia Williams. There we go. Um, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Lori and Susanna. Um, I'm so excited about this series. 
Um, it is my tremendous pleasure to introduce uh, the wonderful Professor Michelle Goodwin. Uh, Michelle is Chancellor's Professor of Law at the University of California at Irvine. She is the founding director of the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy and a member of the American Law Foundation, a fellow at the Hastings Center for Bioethics Research, and a fellow of the American Bar Foundation. Before coming to University of California at Irvine, she was the Everett Fraser Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota with appointments in the law school, in the medical school, and in the School of Public Health. She has been an expert witness for some of the most important reproductive rights cases in America. And I actually just said some, but I mean, she has been an expert who has been called upon in some capacity for nearly every reproductive rights case and or legislative hearing. She is trained as an anthropologist, a sociologist of health sciences, as well as a legal scholar. And she has conducted field research all over the world on every continent but Antarctica, I think, and has helped shape the discourse in all these fields regarding assisted reproductive technology, civil liberties, organ transplant policy, and the intersections among culture, pregnancy, and health outcomes. She is amazingly prolific five books, more than 80 articles, and an infinity of really excellent op-eds. And her podcast, On the Issues, is available on Apple Podcasts. It is wonderful. It is full of really helpful and thoughtfully uh, provocative discussions of contemporary issues that irk us all. And she addresses and unravels these issues with wit, wisdom, charisma, and grace. Her latest book, just out this year, is Policing the Womb, Invisible Women and the Criminalization of Motherhood. Uh, the publisher uh, mentions on that, on, on, on the blurb on the book, that um, this, it is, it is about how the unrestrained efforts to punish and police women's reproduction has led to the United States being the deadliest country in the developed world for, product, for, for pregnant women. And uh, I, I, I am sure that, that, that this comes as a surprise to many people every time uh, this book is mentioned. Um, however, this very brilliant and really shocking book critiques the legal figuration of embryos and fetuses as independent persons legally distinct from the women in whose wounds they develop. And this is a jurisprudence that has arisen in the context of debates about abortion, but Goodwin really traces the deeper, darker history of the eugenics movement's push for state control of women's reproduction. And she shows how criminalizing pregnant women who are incest survivors or suicidal or drug dependent or homeless only exacerbates the brutal consequences of living with trauma, poverty, now pandemic, toxic environmental hazards. hazards. Uh, and Ultimately, this violates this merging of criminality and uh, any potential for medical treatment, violates confidentiality, fiduciary responsibilities of doctors to patients, women's autonomy, privacy, and liberty. It is Michelle's concern about that division of self against self, about which lives are worthy of life, which lives are valuable enough to reproduce, and when and how maternity itself simply disappears. This is such an apt topic for this moment, and I introduce her as my wonderful friend, but particularly, most importantly, someone whose work has always guided and informed my own, Michelle. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction, Pat. Thank you for laying the ground for so many of us in such courageous and robust ways. Um, it is true what was said in terms of the foundation with your work, even before the alchemy of race and rights, but it did spark, uh, it, it sparked so much that really liberated the voices of so many. And so I benefit from that. And 
many people across many fields do as well. So it's my pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you so much for having me in this discussion. Um, what I'll do is begin with, <clears throat> excuse me, three frames, um, if you will. I'll be mindful of time uh, as, as I do so. And uh, given that we're talking about uh, disembodied bodies, then uh, this will seem quite coherent perhaps in sharing these frames. So let me start first with I can't breathe. And in each of these frames, there is a, there's, the, there's the element, the sort of fundamental elements that come out of uh, the book. Years before George Floyd begged to be released from under the knee of Officer Chauvin, Barbara Dawson, a 57-year-old black woman, died begging police officer John Tadlock not to remove her oxygen mask. Her death occurred right outside of the Calhoun Liberty Hospital in Blountstown, Florida, shortly before Christmas 2015. Just before Officer Tadlock's arrival, Miss Dawson arrived at the hospital seeking oxygen, seeking medical support. The hospital's response to Mrs. Dawson's request was to call law enforcement. Photographs show Miss Dawson slumped next to the police car. A police recording captures the tragic end of Miss Dawson's life. Officer Tadlock reprimands Miss Dawson. Falling down like this and laying down, that won't, that's not going to stop you from going to jail, he says. He's a white officer. He speaks quite calmly when he says this. Miss Dawson's life ended on the pavement feet away from the entrance of the hospital that phoned the police on their patient because she refused to leave. She lay there nearly 20 minutes before being pronounced dead. It turns out she had a blood clot in her lungs. In some sense, there's nothing extraordinary about the image of Miss Dawson or the interaction of the hospital and the officer, which further complicates their deadly interaction. Indeed, their interaction was far too normal. Black women, for fear of their health and safety, when they actually care to seek treatment, and then, of course, troublingly, the deaths that come when they do not. When I first saw a photo of Mrs. Dawson cloaked in her red church hat and Sunday clothes, it reminded me of the sepia-hued images of Southern Black grandmothers lined up for church. All that seemed normal, just as ordinary as being transported to a hospital in an ambulance complaining of severe pain, severe chest pain, and expecting to receive care. Yet in the case of Black women, what is common is the fear and risk of being denied appropriate medical services and being turned away. Officer Tadlock says, you can either walk out of here peacefully or I can take you out of here, Miss Dawson panting while the officer calmly informs her of those terribly constrained options, notably neither, in, neither includes giving her the oxygen that she needs. She fitfully calls on God. She says, you can't take that off. You can't take that off. Oh God, no, you can't take that off. What we learn is that hospital staff show the law enforcement officer that he can just simply disconnect the oxygen tube from the wall. My law students are sometimes confused by how they should relate to this. Officer Tadlock speaks in calm, almost entreating ways. His voice is soft. Many of them find that Mrs. Dawson is aggressive. She is loud. To them, this is not what racism looks like. When Mrs. Dawson refuses to surrender the oxygen mask, hospital staff gesture to the wall, informing Officer Tadlock that the ox oxygen supply hose could be disconnected from the port located there. The officer does so. He disconnects the hose. Afterwards, Miss Dawson wails, leave me alone. 
leave me alone. I can't breathe. I beg you, I can't breathe. Her options were constrained. There's not much that this grandmother could do except to beg, in essence, for her life. Within a short period of time, she would be dead. Mrs. Dawson's death revealed the troubling ways in which Black women are marginalized and again and again, and even as they seek medical care. Their health suffers under systemic racism exacerbated by sexism. And we see this in many other ways too. We see this in the reproductive health space. In fact, in the book, I begin a chapter talking about Mrs. Dawson and what happened to her and the cry that she couldn't breathe and begging that a police officer not engage in a process that would otherwise lead to her suffocation and her death. This racism in healthcare expressed through explicit bias, implicit bias, is the ultimate form of suffocation. Such racism often compounded by sexism not only impedes access, but it stifles the ability to properly advocate for oneself, sometimes tragically, to a suffocating and deadly effect. Next, I want to turn to what we could call a reproductive justice bill of rights or a new deal. I actually gave a talk about Barbara Dawson in Paris a few years ago. And when I talked about her, the good thing I suppose, good and bad is that my PowerPoints didn't work out because I was actually going to provide the audio. Um, I couldn't get it to start, talk about things being disembodied, but I shared part of what I shared with you and that audience of bioethicists from Europe and other places in the world were just astounded that this would happen in the United States, that someone goes to the hospital in an ambulance saying that she can't breathe and police are called on her and then she dies feet away from the hospital because they arrest her. All right, next, why we need this Reproductive Justice Bill of Rights or a New Deal. Throughout the process of writing Policing the Womb, Invisible Women and the Criminalization of Motherhood, I struggled to understand what accounts for this period of policing the womb, the vileness directed at women, and the various indignities cast upon in indigent women by the state. I filled notepad after notepad with names and stories. And this reminds me of Pat because Pat does a lot of uh, capturing copiously details. But I did that in the process of this work. Among the many disturbing narratives uh, was that of 12 women sodomized and raped by police officer Daniel Holtzclaw, who literally policed and terrorized their bodies. He raped one of his victims while she was handcuffed to a hospital bed. She testified that she had to think about survival while he raped her. Another victim was underage. According to the lawsuits, Hote's Claw's actions were part of a common pattern and practice of sexually assaulting middle-aged African-American females whom he identified as vulnerable to his sexual abuse and whom he believed would either be reluctant or unwilling to come forward or who would not be believed if they did come forward. These women were not policed because of pregnancy or the potential to become pregnant, but because of their race, poverty, and sex. It is these very biases, poverty, sex, and race, that motivate reproductive policing. On the one hand, this too is nothing new. Black women experience reproductive horrors dating back to chattel slavery. And in many cases, their reproductive rights barely improved during Jim Crow when eugenics policies resulted in coercive state sterilizations. So much so that in Mississippi, forced sterilization against Black women became known as the Mississippi appendectomy. Dr. Marion Sims notoriously lacerated, punctured, and then sutured the uteruses of the enslaved women whom he kept at his home, actually in the back of his place. Dr. Sims regularly tortured Black women, the Black women that he rented as human research subjects. 
nightly lacerating their wounds and conducting experiments, denying them anesthesia in the process. He was doubtful of their ability to experience pain. Today, he is hailed as, quote, the father of gynecology. Until recently, a statue of him adorned Central Park in New York. He loomed so very large there, a man from South Carolina, but who would have a statue bestowed upon him in his likeness in Central Park. Mere years after slavery's abolition, American lawmakers launched an aggressive assault on poor women through eugenics laws upheld by the United States Supreme Court in Buck v. Bell. In that 1927 decision, the Supreme Court claimed that, quote, three generations of imbeciles are enough. The Supreme Court claimed, quote, it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Just as Oliver Wendell Holmes, author of the court's eight to one opinion wrote, the principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. The Third Reich in Nazi Germany learned from this borrowing directly from the Virginia eugenics law upheld by the United States Supreme Court. This is how the Germans started their eugenics efforts. In fact, Joseph S. Dejernart, who was the superintendent at a Virginia hospital, lamented just shortly thereafter, the Germans are beating us at our own game. He was the superintendent at a hospital that prided itself on sterilizing people who were considered to be unfit. This basically meant if you were poor in Virginia and caught by the state for being poor. Fitter family contests took place throughout the US with families lining up throughout the country to show that they were quote, fit. States gave awards to white families that could prove their fitness. For the victims, poor white women, indigenous women, Latinas, and black women, this was state-sponsored terrorism. Even in the 1990s, states continued to carry out these practices. In 1974, Alabama sterilized the sisters, Mary Alice and Minnie Ralph, when they were aged 14 and 12, respectively. Years later, a lawsuit filed by the Southern Poverty Law Center on behalf of the Ralph sisters revealed that federally funded programs sterilize somewhere between 100,000 to 150,000 people each year. Now, clearly, some of those sterilizations may have been voluntary, but the majority were very likely facilitated through coercive means. In Puerto Rico, it is estimated that one third of its female population was sterilized so common it was called la operacion, the operation. It's unknown how many American women in total suffered this fate or continue to as Buck v. Bell was never overturned. For example, a 2013 legislative report conducted by California State Auditor Elaine Howe found, quote, numerous illegal surgeries and violations of the state's informed consent law. The investigator reported that nearly 150 women were sterilized while incarcerated in California's prisons during the period between 2006 and 2010. In a letter to the former governor, Jerry Brown, Ms. Howe wrote that in some instances, women were sterilized without physicians signing the forms or certifying the competency of the women um, or that the women understood the lasting effects of the procedure. In another instance, the state's correction office ignored the state's waiting period before the sterilizations could take place. At least 25% of the California prison sterilizations in the 2000s occurred without any lawful consent. And the, quote, true numbers of illegal procedures might very well be higher, it was reported. This week's Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, actually called on an investigation of the Department of Homeland Security after a whistleblower complained about forced sterilization amongst women at an ICE detention center. An investigation is actually urgently needed, but for members of Congress who claim that this would never happen in the United States, history proves them wrong. 
importantly, it is for the reasons that I've described here that I do think that law can play a role, certainly should, at least a reproductive bill of rights or a new deal could perhaps actually speak to those issues. And when I think about the attacks that have occurred in the reproductive health space, it's not just abortion, it's not just sterilization. There are many different ways in which this disembodiment by the state and the surveilling and this policing has taken place. We see it in the attacks on sex education in schools, including ma uh, mandating harmful abstinence-only instruction, the rollbacks on contraceptive access, the high rates of unaddressed maternal mort mortality, threats to abortion access, including during the plan pandemic, slashing of funding associated with breast and cervical care screening under this administration. And given the high rates of mass incarceration, women's mass incarceration in this country that goes side by side with extreme rates of medical neglect, I think law could certainly play a role. Now, I'm hoping that I have just a few minutes more, do I, just for a last bit that I wanna do. All right, so let me now turn to a last bit directly from the book. This is not a work of fiction, although I wish it were. Some of the cases described here could recall the imagery evoked by Mary Shelley, author of Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, who tells a horror story about a young rogue scientist who creates an unsightly monster through clandestine aberrant experimentation. Although Frankenstein is the name of the monster's creator, Dr. Victor Frankenstein, readers would be forgiven for debating who the real monster happens to be. In Policing the Womb, the story of Marlise Munoz comes to mind, brain dead, decomposing in a Texas hospital, forced by state legislation to gestate a barely developing fetus while her body decays and the anomalies in the fetus mount. Eventually, it is reported that the fetus is hydrocephalic, which means severe brain damage in this case and water or fluid developing on its brain. Medical reports will also show that the fetus is not developing its lower extremities. The state knows brain death is irreversible. The hospital forces Marlise's dead body to shake, placing it on a bed that constantly and violently moves, which makes the dead woman's eyes flap open and shut. Likely frightening to some hospital staff, they decide to tape Marlise's eyes shut, even if Marlise could see anything, which is unlikely because she is dead, now, no one needs to look into her eyes to search for any signs of life. If the state believes, despite well-accepted medical science, that she is alive, it has now taken away her sight and forced her into a state of blindness while her body is poked and prodded. Marlise's shaking corpse stays hydrated through tubes that bring fluids into her body. Somehow, the state excuse me, somehow the hospital finds a way to pipe away the waste. Everyone, including even the state, agrees that really she is an incubator. This is why the Texas law exists. This is not the novel The Handmaid's Tale, a dystopian opus written by Margaret Atwood made exceedingly relevant today. The shaking bed is not in the totalitarian fictional state of Gilead. No, this is Texas. This is why the state forces machines to be attached to Marlise's body to keep her organs functioning until they give out. The machines are not keeping her alive, no. They are simply, simply keeping her organs viable. This is why the hospital cleaves into her body with slicing, lacerating, and stitching tools, tapes her eyes shut, pumps her with fluids, and then drains other liquids from what remains of her. Her decaying has nothing to do with senescence or aging. Rather, it has and is the typical decomposition characteristic of brain death cases. Hoses, pipes, and cylinders serve as the conduits between the state and Marlise's dead body, decaying body. This is known as mechanical support. The hospital cuts a hole into Marlise's neck to create an opening in the trachea. She will receive a tracheotomy. 
The widower, Eric, objects. This is a desecration of Marlise's body. The hospital must be used to ignoring Eric's objections. He said no and objected to the second resuscitation attempt. The hospital did it anyway. He sits there daily as her light brown skin transitions from supple to hard, like a mannequin, Marlise's father said. Her body loses muscle tone and begins to smell. Eric comments on the smell. That smell lingers. It's not the smell of Marlise's favorite perfume or flowers from the tidy hospital gift shop. No, the smell that fills the room in Eric's nostrils and those of anyone who visits the room is that of a rotting body. No one except perhaps the select group of anti-abortion protesters outside is confused about this. Marlise is dead. Outside, though, someone tells filmmaker Rebecca Hamowitz, just give Marlise a week. You'll see, he says. A week or two will turn this all around, he says. This particular protest, this particular protester, captured in Hamowitz's documentary, 62 Days, travels to cases like this. She told me he's like a professional at this. A thought comes to mind. Sleeping Beauty, the 1959 animated musical produced by Walt Disney. It is based on the 17th century French fairy tale, La Belle à Bois Dormant, by Charles Perrault. In the fairy tale, a beautiful princess is forced into hypnotic, uh, hypnotic slumber. The spell she is under will only be broken by the magical kiss of the prince the prince will awaken her. However, Marlise's real life prince, Eric, does not harness this magic, or perhaps the state has dethroned Eric. But if that is the case, who is the new prince? The Texas legislature? In any case, Eric Munoz lacks any special powers to rouse Marlise despite what the protesters outside the hospital claim. In fact, Eric no longer has rights over his wife's body until the state is satisfied with Marlise's gestation and cuts open her body to remove the fetus. It turns out that marriage and the rights of the next of kin mean very little when the state takes control of a pregnant woman's body in order to protect the fetus. The state refers to this as fetal protection. In this case, the state is protecting the fetus from Marlise's husband and her parents who say, let her rest in peace. The hospital serves as a surrogate or agent of the state. This is not a role its staff have asked for, but some may fear the consequences if they do not follow the state's legislation. The medical staff know that she is dead, but they must follow the Texas law, which ignores death, do not resuscitate orders, medical directives, and living wills only if the patient is pregnant. Wow. Michelle, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for being our inaugural guest to, to start off our composite body seminar series. I can't think of anybody whose work is more resonant with this moment as we think about this shifting landscape of surveillance and policing the disproportionately uh, traps and tracks and harms um, vulnerable populations. Um, I have a million different questions that I have for you, but I want to I want to start with kind of a really basic one. Given um, this powerful description that you provide, I think in the beginning of policing the womb, that's the first, that's what you start with. Is that narrative of uh, Marlise Munoz in Texas, who has been declared deceased and then becomes the incubator, essentially. Right. Um, because of that medical legal, legal landscape of fetal protection laws, right? Okay. And in the very beginning of, of your uh, presentation today, you mentioned coherence. And what this speaks to is the incredible incoherence of this landscape of fetal protection laws. And so I wanted to ask you kind of a basic question going back to your point about um, a new deal or a reproductive bill of light rights. Can you talk a little bit about the blind spots of the kind of liberal feminist rights-based approach to 
um, reproduction and, and differentiate that from the more justice cent centered kind of approach that, that you talk about in your book? I'm, I'm happy to, and thank you again so very much. So the rights-based approach must be understood within the very limited imaginations to be inclusive about race. And this limited imagination then was not only to the exclusion of thinking about Black women, and we could date that you know, back to the 19th Amendment, we could date that back to white women's ownership of enslaved persons, right? But within the context of the reproductive health rights framework, abortion took center stage. And so when there was opportunity to be engaged and mindfully engaged, particularly, I mean, you can think about any period of time, you can think about this even after Roe, as the Supreme Court said, okay, we will legalize abortion, but we will not move forward in striking down Hyde or any state-based laws that deny abortion access to poor pregnant women. We will support poor pregnant women carrying their pregnancies a term and paying thousands of dollars more for that, but we will not support their decision to be able to terminate a pregnancy within that space. It could have been, you know, real attention and aggressive efforts. What many people don't know is that there was a pre-Roe framework right after Roe for poor women, particularly women of color. And there were women of color who died, in essence, of back alley abortions after Roe v. Wade. But the period of time where we, where there was the most aggressive and egregious gap happened to be during the 1980s and 90s where this perfect storm came about, this perfect storm that engaged both the rise in mass incarceration, right, the sort of taste and addiction that the state has for incarceration, um, the taste and addiction that the state had for targeting people who used crystallized cocaine, but only the black people who used crystallized cocaine, because I think it's really important that we understand that white folks used crack at the same rates that black people did, only black people were targeted for the criminal prosecution for their use of crack. And the very ways in which um, narratives became so successful um, in, the, oh my gosh, I mean, one could date back, back to slavery, but really, you know, sort of the Jim Crow period, which he, are we still riding the surf of Jim Crow? All through that period, right? So this kind of addiction for mass incarceration, these people who utilize crack are really dangerous kind of people. And if a woman utilizes crack during her pregnancy, not only is she a bad mother and a dangerous person who needs to be locked away and also sterilized, but additionally, she has, she is and will give birth to these rogue people who will bring guns and knives to the school. You know, watch out because the criminalization, the, the sort of criminal that we have to watch out for in our schools that are going to be blowing up our schools are these black kids whose mothers used crack during their pregnancy. And what's amazing about that time, and I write about it in the book, taking direct quotes from the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Rolling Stone and whatnot, were the horrific racialized ways in which black children were talked about. You know, the, the, the claims that black children whose mothers used crystallized cocaine have different sized brains. They have different genitalia. They have different sized internal organs. You can't make that up. And I was not. <laughs> <laughs> like combing through like right wing media like this is these are the papers of record that were publishing this vitriol you know calling it the brave new world and it's of course is very interesting to to think about empirically what we knew at that time uh, in terms of white women and their drug use, both illicit and also prescription use. The illicit use a little bit more than black women and the prescription prescription use off the charts which we now account for today, right? But anyway, then the third part of this perfect storm that takes place at, at this time is also the stereotyping of the welfare queen, right? So all of this comes together in a way to stigmatize, stereotype Black women in a very powerful way and organizations that could get involved in this and see this for what it is. This is stigmatiza stigmatization, this is shaming. And when the state is doing this and going after pregnant women, they're going after our people. But that is not, that's not what organizations that are involved in this space did. And so these organizations stood back as there were prosecutors that would say, oh, you're a black woman and you just had a miscarriage, manslaughter. You're a black woman and you, you know, just had a stillbirth, 
murder. So you had black women taking plea deals of 20 years, 10 years, and so forth. You don't want us to put this before a jury. You told your nurse, you know, all these nurse ratchet, you told your nurse that at some point during your pregnancy, you used a drug. Meanwhile, what did we know? Data from that period tells us that even though we see equal rates of illicit drug use during that time, black women were, women were 10 times more likely uh, to re be reported um, to authorities than white women were when white women shared the same information. Not only that, we know because of data that's been tracked for more than the last 50 years that those who are more likely uh, to use prescription medications during pregnancy are white women. The more highly educated they are, wealthy and white, the more likely that they're using prescription medications during their pregnancy. And we're not talking about Tylenol. We're talking about Oxycontin, Demerol, and often in cocktail effects. Now, I don't say this as a way of stigmatizing women in those categories, but I draw the distinction of the bad black mother and the sort of targeting of this woman when we know on this other side, here's this other universe. And in fact, to crystallize it in really clear ways about the slippage and why a reproductive justice agenda is needed, right? Because these are spaces that this doesn't look like abortion and folks were like, that doesn't look like abortion. Why should we be involved? But they should have been involved for dignity reasons, for sisterhood reasons, and if they were just thinking in the Derrick Bell context, right, about um, just their own interest, interest convergence, that one day these women were just simply the canaries in the coal mine and that this would come back to haunt them, right? So Derrick Bell's theory was that, look, white people will be involved in things that interest them and that support their interests. In this case, white women missed that too, because as collaborations were launching forward between medical providers and police and prosecutors to specifically target black women, they were often relying on laws that actually hadn't been written yet. They were relying on child abuse statutes. They were relying on statutes that, you know, were for people who were involved in big drug crimes, right? And, you know, and seeing the pregnant person as the conspirator, you know, in, in providing drugs to her fetus or considering the fetus the equivalent of like a 12 year old. So anyway, I'll stop there. There are more questions. I don't need to, to belabor the point, but thank you for that. I am just so struck by the degree to which when you invoke Frankenstein and a monster, um, I am uh, that, that you really are uh, bringing forward, not just the deploy of stereotypes, but imagined bodies. There's an entire cartography of fairy tale bodies that, that, that completely escape any kind of data or statistics or on the ground reality that it defies even life and death. And so you began by saying, I can't breathe. And I was struck throughout much of what you're narrating is I can't see that the ability to see how not just race and racism, race and racism, because you, you, as you point out, this, is, this exceeds simply an affliction that affects black bodies entirely. Um, that the ability to see humanity is playing out at this fictive, imaginary embodiment of, you know, that in, in which autonomy, complete autonomy is assigned to an imagined fetus um, that is then pitted against um, a, a living, breathing, and then dead body. And, and that, that imaginary cartography, I think, is really interesting. It, it, it exceeds what I think we can even call mere stereotype. And you, and you are so right. So when I think about it in terms of the imagined bodies, right? So, so if we hail back to the antebellum period in the United States, imagine what it takes for people to convince themselves that this child who looks just like the person who owns the plantation somehow is more alike to the pig or the goat that's housed over there. And to convince over a period of time that's not just a kind of horrific 10 minutes or an hour at an auction block, right? Like if we were all at a movie and there was about 15 minutes of auction blocking. And it was common with the auction blocks that sometimes people arrived, including little kids with heavy metal shackles around their necks, shackles around their ankles. Sometimes they were clothed, but oftentimes they were not. 
there were probes of their uh, mouths. There were probes of their genitalia. All of these things people think thought were important the inspecting their property. And imagine if we had to sit through that 15, 20 minutes in a movie, at some point I, I would imagine that there would be critics that would say that is gratuitous. We had to sit through 15 minutes of this gratuity of, you know, the bending over and the opening the mouth and all the rest of this. We get, imagine people who live through not just 15 minutes of it, they get kind of like addicted and they justify all the time, $5, $10, $100, $150. And it doesn't just last a day. It doesn't just last a week. It doesn't just last a month and not just a year, not just a decade, but people are just like addicted. What stories? must people be telling themselves and it's not stories to stories that are isolated right like like this is the only story which I think is really important that my students hear sometimes because students sometimes you know believe that you know what this was the only way that they knew how to do it's not true it's not true there's very different stories that were taking place throughout other parts of the country there were abolitionists we just don't build statues to them but there were people who were like this is humanity there there were there were wives writing in their diaries how much they hated seeing their children, their husband's children around the plantation, right? And so these narratives, as you were saying, Pat, are very powerful. I think one of the narratives that we fail to deal with appropriately is that in our society is really engaged birth of a nation as a narrative, right? We sort of come from a time where um, there's the abolition of slavery through the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which is complicated given its punishment clause. What we go from there, 1865, and the fact that people are saying these are human beings now, we, we can rest on the fact that they are human, and we have this little period of reconstruction, but then we need a new movement, right? And that new movement comes out of Birth of a Nation, right? And it's fascinating because Birth of a Nation, you know, has multiple points, but right, it's achieving multiple things. One of the things that it needs to do is to say that black people are inherently dangerous and that black men are sexually depraved and that they are just like coming after white women, coming after white women. They have to say that black people are incredibly lazy, just like slothful, lazy, lazy people. And if we just take those two points, and we can take many others, and we put that against a history of slavery. And you say, well, we're all the accounts from all the plantations of black men run wild. All of the little white girls that were like raped on the plantations and all of the Miss Anns that were like raped and we come to realize there is no record of that. But how clever through birth of the nation, we have a justification for the lynching of black men and for creating a different kind of policing and surveillance. And the other thing about the slothful, lazy black person, which is also very interesting, right? And it says so much for us as we are, you know, at academic institutions and the narrative behind, oh, those black students. You know, we could admit them, but my goodness, will they be deserving of the degrees that they earn? Because after all, we're living within this narrative. But then again, look at the record. We don't have a record of slave owners being like, oh my gosh, my slaves are just so lazy. Who's, I gotta pick my own cotton. I gotta cut my own sugar cane because they are so lazy. No, these are the narratives we tell ourselves. I want to continue on this amazing thread of narratives especially spurious narratives, because one of the really compelling things that your book does for me, the policing the womb again, um, is I see that thread of narratives of protection, uh, narratives of rescue that pervade not just the legal discourse, but the medical discourse, the state discourse. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about those narratives of rescue that are also, of course, embedded in Birth of a Nation. And, and after all, that's the narrative of the Ku Klux Klan, that, that the Klan emerges out of this, this strong need to have protectors of, of not just nationhood, but white femininity. So um, yeah, I wonder if you have some thoughts about how, how law, medicine, the state um, come together or congeal around these ideas of protection and uh, rescue. So I so appreciate that question. And for those who are interested in reading a, a, a tad about this in the book, there are lots of spaces of it, but I would refer them in the very beginning, like pages five through seven, where I talk about welfare. And it's stunning because some of these were areas that 
are not ones that were necessarily foundational to the work that I do. They became because I was doing this, this book. And it's amazing then to think about then in states, this narrative of protection and, uh, and needing to protect the fetus, but how that ends so swiftly and so quickly after birth, and the ways in which then women become policed again when they seek assistance from the state. And so I write about um, the SNAP program, which is the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, which is commonly referred to as food stamp. And at the time that I was writing, you know, the book early on about the Trump, Trump proposals to cut back on that, um, and they've been cut back some more, but even more what I found fascinating were the ways in which states so monitor how recipients of food stamps spend their money that they monitor even birthday cakes, how much in terms of decoration happens to be on the children's birthday cake. And you just say, well, aren't there better things to be worried about than, you know, than how much of the cake had decoration versus how much of the cake had cake. Um, and so what we know is that it's spurious and that it's specious, right? These sort of claims of real protection, um, these claims that there is any kind of real care. And it makes me think about um, the case of Margaret Garner, but it just comes to mind. Margaret Garner uh, is a person who was enslaved in Kentucky, who had been raped by the person who claimed ownership of her, and she uh, escaped. Yeah, talk about, uh, right, the indefatigability of these women, right? Like, like the real thing that we should be trying to bottle is like the strength of Black women from during that period of time, because this is during the winter, right? She has no fancy shoes, right? She has no boots, no Nikes and whatnot. And she makes her way from Kentucky crossing a river with her children, foot and a sled, so that she can get into Cincinnati, which is a free territory, uh, a key part of the Underground Railroad. And she so doesn't want to return to slavery or for this to be the life of her children, that as the uh, hunters come, the bounty hunters and the person who claimed ownership of her, Mr. Gaines, uh, and the sheriff, she begins slitting the throats of her children. So she kills the one child. She's about to slit the throat of another, and she's apprehended. Um, and what she wants to do is, is die. She's like, you know, I don't want my kids to be enslaved. I don't want to be enslaved. And it's an interesting story then about property and oneself, because in the case, Margaret is actually not charged with murder because to be charged with murder is to recognize the personhood in the child. The child is property. She is property. She can't be, she's only mother via some technicality of birth because these are just two propertied, you know, beings. And, um, and because of the Fugitive Slave Act, this is basically what she violated, and then she is returned to slavery. So it's a very interesting thing. It's a disembodiment. It's just pure disembodiment um, is what it actually was. And for those who are unfamiliar with that story, that, that disembodiment becomes the ghost in Toni Morrison's book, Beloved. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and I'll add to that, too, that... As we think about reproductive justice, many people think about this in a, a modern lens. Uh, what it does is it speaks to the wholeness of the full space and capacity of one's being in life, if, when, how, whether to have a child, not to have a child, all of that, that fullness. And its earliest iterations, many people attach it to um, a convening of Black women in the mid-1990s. But I think about it along the lines of Sojourner Truth or uh, Harriet Jacobs in her book, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. And when I think about it in the context of Sojourner Truth and her speech, Ain't I a Woman, many people think about that speech within the context of chivalry. But I find what so many miss, because I just don't see people talking about it, is how she taught me how she said during that speech and I birthed 13 children 
and nearly each one snatched from my arms and nobody heard my cry but god ain't i a woman I have a couple of questions that I am going to try to combine together because we have so little time. Um, but from the audience, we're getting a question, a couple of questions that actually remind me of a version of your, the question you often ask um, people on your podcast, the kind of silver lining kind of question, perhaps. Um, and the question is, are there specific forms of legislation that you recommend? Um, and is it possible through policy, through legislation to somehow divorce medical practices, medical abuses from mm -hmm. pernicious forms of state authority? I know that's a huge question to answer in like one minute. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, let me take the first part, which is to say, sadly, so much of the effort needs to also be in the repeal space, right? Because we have uh, the Hyde Amendment, the Helms Amendment, the 13th Amendment itself, which still allows for slavery so long as an individual is convicted of a crime. And so by thinking of a reproductive New Deal or a Bill of Rights, it attempts to recognize the personhood and the dignity in an individual and the protection of, um, you know, as broad a space as possible of an individual being able to secure his or her or they dignity, the dignity of the person. And I find that to be crucially um, important. And it is in the book and I devote a chapter to it, and so I would love to see that, but but we need also this repeal of so much, yeah. And there was a part two to that question too that that dealt with the. I think it was it was the question of how whether it's possible to decouple these collaborations amongst oh. medicine, the law, uh, <laughs> state policy, et cetera. Well, sure, I think so. I mean, I know, I certainly, certainly it's possible. I think the challenge has been that we, that as a culture, we couple. As a couple, as, as a culture, we have a bit of fluidity with regard to our xenophobia, racism, sexism, all of these, right? So they flow, they don't have to, right? There can be barriers to that. Uh, where we are protective of the um, collective and of the individual. So, and I know doctors who say that, you know, I will refuse to do that. I refuse to release my patient's medical information. Mm -hmm. And of course that happens all the time, you know, for people who can afford, I have medical insurance and see private physicians. There are all sorts of things that they disclose all the time and they don't have to worry about police surrounding their houses and arresting them and subjecting them to inhumane, undignified treatment. Michelle. Thank you so much. I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, this has been an extraordinary tour de force as usual. Um, if tour de forces can be normative, you embody that. Um, thank you so very much. Um, and uh, uh, I, I invite the audience to join us again for our next speaker um, in two weeks, Caroline, is that right? Um, I think it's October 28th. I'm sorry, October 28th. Uh, October 28th, and um, right, and more details will be available on our website. And and I also just want to, I, I pasted information about Professor Goodwin's amazing recent book, Policing the Womb, in case you're interested, and also please check out her amazing podcast as well. Thank you so much. It was my honor and pleasure to be with you this afternoon. What a wonderful coming together. I look forward to tuning in and seeing the other speakers and your engagements uh, with them. What a great opportunity for, for us all to be involved with this project. Thank you, Michelle. Thank, Thank you so Michelle. much. And I believe our next speaker will be Karen Barrett, who's philosopher extraordinaire and theoretical physicist, whose theory of agential realism um, has shaped uh, a, a tremendously dynamic uh, area of feminist uh, philosophy. And uh, she's with the History of Consciousness at UC Santa Cruz. And we look forward to that, um, this being, again, such a wonderful beginning. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so Take much. Care.